All right. Well, hello everyone to our latest edition of the Predictive AI World. We are back with um, an excellent topic of discussion today, which is the essentials of B2B sales success during challenging times. Uh, times can't get more challenging than they have been and are now. I'm your host, Malaya Padhya. I'm the Chief Customer Experience Officer at Sales Choice, and I'm joined as always by our CEO and founder, Dr. Cindy Gordon. Cindy? Thanks, Malaya. Looking forward to our session and welcome Shannon and Greg. And I can see Candy in the audience, uh, and I can't see all the other names, but welcome to today's session. Thank you. Um, and I'll be bringing the audience in um, as they arrive. Uh, we have an excellent gaggle today, but to echo Cindy's terms, we are joined today by two excellent thought leaders who I'll be introducing in just a moment. But before that, uh, what is the predictive AI world, just for some context setting? Uh, we have held this forum for several years now um, to essentially incorporate and bring together voices that bring in decades of experience in the domain of AI and sales. And we've had numerous experts, executives who have lent their voices, shared their opinions in what is now a collection of extremely informative content that you can find at saleschoice.com slash resources. I repeat that saleschoice.com slash resources. I invite all of you to go and check it out for a whole bunch of podcasts, video series, as well as webinars, besides case studies, blogs, uh, and a lot of other pieces. Now, coming back to the here and now, uh, if you move to the next slide, Cindy. As Cindy mentioned, uh, Cindy and I are joined today by Greg Nutter, who is the best-selling author of B3 Selling, and I'll invite his voice in just a moment, and Shannon Hamilton, uh, the head of sales, VP of sales at BlackBerry Radar extremely accomplished individuals and who are better to talk about them than they, they themselves. So if you go to the next slide and start with Greg. Greg, welcome to our Predictive World Forum. Uh, can we get a few words from you? Sure, thanks, Malay. Um, pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, um, I think uh, I've uh, been in the business of sales and sales management and consulting for over 25 years, I hate to date myself, but uh, what, what has given me a really interesting perspective or different perspective around sales best practices is I've had the opportunity not only to be a chief revenue officer, managed uh, almost 10, 10 different sales teams, but I've also done a lot of sales training, sales development, sales coaching for both uh, sellers as well as sales management. Um, the other perspective I bring is I've worked with little small startups which have maybe a million dollars in business and I've worked with some of the big names you see on the screen there so um, wide range of experience in both doing and coaching as well as wide range of organizations that I've had the, uh, the pleasure of working with. Well, it's a pleasure to have you with us Craig thank you for that. Uh, moving on to the next one, we have Shannon Hamilton. Shannon, always a pleasure to talk to you and so good to have you here with us. Uh, let's hear from you now. Thank you, Malay. So, so nice to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, so I think what makes uh, my background and perhaps perspective, and I'm looking forward to the conversation, is uh, I started my career in customer success and back office operations kind of really learning like how businesses run and all of the, the process and, and people parts of, of uh, how many companies operate. Uh, and then had the great fortune of being asked to move into a sales role. So uh, I've held leadership roles with large companies similar to Greg and also worked across a number of different scrappy startups. Um, and I think, you know, having purchased and also been responsible for implementing various enterprise technologies, um, I have, you know, some good insights to be able to bring to the bring to the table. So I'm very much looking forward to the discussion today. And uh, I'm always learning. So I appreciate, Greg, the opportunity to learn more from uh, all of your experience as well. Thank you, Shannon. And we are looking forward to learning from you today. So without further ado, let me turn things over to Cindy to take it from here. Cindy. Thanks, Malay. And again, welcome, Greg and Shannon. And for those of you in the audience, just really um, want to point out that 
please feel free to answer questions. We're going to leave time at the end so we can bring your voices in. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with Greg uh, many years ago at Xerox. So uh, for those of you who don't know my background, it was really rooted initially in strategic consulting, sales, and then large-scale enterprise uh, deployments. Uh, usually the messier the programs were, I was always happy uh, to try and align, uh, you know, enablements. Um, you know, we want to start this conversation off around today's selling environment. And obviously we've all been through a very unique period, a historical time in our lives, you know, in terms of going through COVID. And we still have the persistence uh, of post COVID going on and the realities of the hybrid work environment. You know, we're seeing that there's a great resignation going on in the broader sales environment right now and concerns about churn. Uh, we also constantly have the beat of digital literacy and advanced analytics. And Shannon, in your field, obviously, with BlackBerry and uh, the Internet of Things and asset management, an incredibly exciting high growth space. But I'm sure that in, you know, you always see challenges in sales in because of things that are new, right, and that are disruptive mm -hmm. in many ways. And then, Greg, I'm so proud of you for writing a book on uh, 3P selling. We're going to talk about what was the impetus uh, to write the book. Uh, I'm sure with all the tremendous experiences that you had, you wanted to, you're probably saying some of the same things over and over again. So you had to get it out of your head. So mm -hmm. having written myself 14 books, I know that those gremlins, when they appear, uh, they're really important to get out because they never seem to go away until they're written down. There's, I, I believe there's this an uncanny um, you know, correlation there for ideation and the need to, to communicate. So our, our agenda today is very much talking about today's selling environment, uh, pulling great thoughts from Shannon and Greg, and then spending some time on the P selling, uh, P3 selling approach. So let's just start here. I've kind of just done a, a brief introduction. I'm just going to engage both uh, Shannon and Greg with some specific questions so that they can elaborate on these themes. We'll just leave the themes in the background. And maybe, uh, Shannon, uh, we can start with you in the sense, because you've got a very complex enterprise sale, right? Uh, just to talk about what you're seeing and observing in the B2B selling environment on solution complexity, uh, buyer perceptions of risk, uh, and how you're navigating and also attracting uh, the right talent that actually can sell a complex sale, because, you know, it, it's not a transactional sale that you have. No, thank you, Cindy. That's there. There's a lot to unpack there. So um, maybe we'll we'll start with sort of the complexity. Um, I think, as you know, as Greg's noted in in his book, and uh, what what I'm seeing is is just it's there's more people across the organization that um, are involved in the buying process. Um, in the last three plus years, I've been working across supply chain related sales, um, which really touches. I know we've all become, you know, probably more aware of what supply chain is all about since COVID and where our toilet paper came from and having all sorts of, of good line of sight to these types of things. Um, but it, it's, it's a part of the organization when you're selling into a group like that, that really connects um, every part of the organization. So you've got technology folks, you've got transportation folks, you've got um, HR and finance. Um, so more and more people coming to the table. And then, you know, I don't know, during COVID, I just found there were a lot of people moving roles, uh, being deployed into different parts of the organization. So every time you thought you had corralled your key decision makers, there were more people coming into the equation um, or kind of being swapped out. So always this approach of kind of take two steps back to take, take a step forward um, in terms of the selling process. Greg, I don't know if you've, you've seen that as well, but um, really being good at um, understanding the dynamics of all of the different people in the organization, their roles, what's important to them, uh, what their problems might be, because, um, you know, again, just using supply chain as the example, whether you're at the beginning of the process or the end of the process, your, uh, the problems and what you're tasked with solving are likely quite different. So it, it requires an individual from a talent standpoint, Cindy, as you mentioned, to really be quite dynamic. Um, I'm kind of somebody that promotes being uh, fiercely curious, you know, so that you're asking a lot of questions um, and, and not assuming what's important to folks, but um, how information gets used by those different groups is, is often very different. And the further and the more detailed you can kind of understand um, the information, why it's important, how it's gonna solve problems and, and link it back to, again, those priorities 
Um, it's, it's, it's a uniquely skilled individual. Um, and being fiercely curious is something that I look for when, when I'm, when I'm hiring for sure. Thanks, Shannon. Um, you know, I love the term fearless curiosity uh, for sales professionals. I think there's an opportunity for a new book there. So that might <laughs> be a little gremlin for you. It's, it's a great uh, phrase. Um, Greg, what are you seeing in, in the marketplace, um, you know, in your panoramic view? And I know you've got some experience over with clients in Asia, um, but anything you can elaborate or challenge in terms of what Shannon shared? No, I would agree with everything Shannon said. I mean, the starting point is that Today's products have tons more features than they ever had before. And the value of those features is not always obvious. Why is this? I mean, uh, Cindy, uh, you're, uh, with your company are heavily into artificial intelligence, AI. And there's AI and there's AI, you know? So I was talking to a client recently who was um, looking at an AI solution and it was like, well, we've used AI before, it didn't always meet our needs, can you tailor it? And the answer is yes. And then it's the next, well, how do you tailor it? And what's involved in tailoring it? And so that, all of that little nuances, those nuances around a solution just make it so much complicated. And that makes it therefore difficult to do make buying decisions. People lose their jobs, people's careers get dead ended by buying something that doesn't go anywhere. Um, or the user community um, boycotts what they're buying and refuses to use it. Um, and, and so buying processes now take longer, involve more people. Um, I think I quoted some statistics like 10, 10 to 15 years ago, there were three or four people involved in it decision. Now, even companies that are less than 50 million have uh, 10 or more people involved in the decision. So they take longer, more people involved, more information to process. The last one's really important. And I think Shannon, you, you uh, certainly evaluated on the value of salespeople. Um, in the old days, <laughs> You know, you brought a salesperson in because they gave you product information. They told you about your product, but you don't really need a salesperson today to do that. You can find out an awful lot about somebody's product by going on the web, by talking to user groups, to analysts, whether it's Gartner or someone else. You don't need a sales rep to give you much information, maybe a price, and even that you can find. Um, I saw a lot of research where salespeople were being brought in later and later in a sales cycle because no one saw or very few people saw value in them up front in defining needs um, or this relationship thing. Um, and so salespeople need to do something different to be valued, to um, help the process rather than just being people, people who bring in product information. And that's a real challenge for sellers today. So Greg, what do you think some of the solutions are in Shannon um, in terms of that dynamic? Uh, is it that we have AI take over the whole front end enablement process and we, we, we just bring the closers in? Uh, I just love some you know, thoughts that you might have. Uh, you know, there's certainly been some research on the, <clears throat> the death of the B2B sales professional from a futuristic perspective. Um, but in the meantime, we are where we are. And we need to, we have plans to make, right? And, you know, Shannon, I was, as I was listening to you, I was thinking about, yes, there's more and more iterations and cycles, but is there patience within the CROs in terms of, you know, hitting that number, um, you know, because we set our plans and, you know, they're usually uh, pretty aggressive. So thoughts on, on how we manage through that dynamic to get the right fit. Um, is it the challenger sale? You know, you come in adding value and it's outside the box, thinking outside the box. Um, is it being really more clever in how you approach uh, the account? Uh, just would love to hear some stories. I mean, I've got some of my own thoughts, but uh, just to open it up for the, how do we solve the problem is, is the question. Or the opportunity. Well, uh, maybe I'll jump in. So the challenger sale which uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, was a book written about 10 years ago. Um, excellent starting point. In fact, a lot of uh, the ideas you'll see in my book uh, start with the same idea of a challenger, which is um, uh, to try to create awareness. So I look at 
uh, four or five transformations that a seller needs to make today to be valuable. Um, the first one is, you know, moving from uh, someone who talks about product to somebody who talks about problems. Um, moving from someone who tells to someone who asks, which is not just challenger sale, it goes all the way back to Neil Rackham's book on spin selling. Um, changing the role of the salesperson from someone who is the relationship manager to someone who's an expert on the buying process. Oops, I didn't say selling process. I said buying process to help guide a customer through step-by-step -step for what do they need to do? Who do they need to bring on? What do they need to consider to help making that buying process easier? Um, the last part I think is thinking about selling more of as a process and less as an art form. It's, um, um, there's a lot of science done around the fact that, uh, or research done around the fact that salespeople who are very methodical, very structured, and it doesn't mean you have to be stiff and can't tell a joke or smile, um, but there is definitely a structured approach to selling today that's really required rather than going in, taking someone for lunch, giving a price and hoping they buy. So those are the key transformations I see for sellers to start adding value to the buying process. Thanks, Greg. Shannon, what are your thoughts um, in terms of what Greg said and anything else to add or challenge? And... Yeah, so I like to take, uh, you know, Cindy, and you said you, you've done some, and I know you have some strategic consulting, but I, I feel like the role of, of the sales professionals now is almost that of a consultant, right? We've got to ask a lot of questions. We've got to digest a lot of information, um, but I, I think, you know, when, as we're going through that process and we're maybe talking less about the, the, the product features because we're, we're trying to get ingrained into the business, um, what we what I've seen can happen, um, and I've been a little bit around emerging technologies, you know, and, and blockchain, and, and now I'm in IoT and, and leaning into to, um, artificial intelligence as well as sometimes all of this inquiry and learning to try to understand what the problem is means that what we're selling is becoming less clear um and it's like kind of you need to like stop talking figure out what 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 you want to show to start moving the conversation forward because you can spend a lot of time doing education um, to make sure that everybody's on the same page and that you have a good understanding of the business and they have a good understanding of what you're presenting so for me, um, trying to move as quickly into the showing versus telling um, is is super important. So I'm a big fan of, like, let's spin up, um, you know, whether it's in the sandbox or in a you know a test scenario. Let's show what the information, the solution looks like, because what better way for a company to kind of get excited about the buy-in and what's possible is to see their own information in the solution that's being presented. So for me, it's right now it's it's asset management and you know people aren't curious about where their assets are, but they might be curious around how they could improve other parts of their business. So let me show you. Um, and so, yeah, I guess it's, my caution is we can spend a lot of time and actually elongate the process by trying to do education and learning a lot about the, the, the prospects business. Um, that we miss the opportunity to kind of accelerate the showing part. So, um, you know, it's, it is, there is art and science. I, I totally respect that, but um, I do um, with something that I think Greg, it might've been you that said it, but um, in this day and age, nobody wants to buy something that isn't going to be successful. Um, there's too much at risk. People have been very much focused on what I say, you know, keeping the lights on, run the business type activities. So, how do you de-risk that? Well, sh you know, show it to them, make it as real as possible so that, um, you know, they can hopefully become less, less worried in the process and you can move forward uh, faster. Yeah, there's some um, research uh, around your theme of the agile innovation ideation because it creates this concrete, you know, visibility to what may not be understood, right? And being able to extract or synthetic data, right? Because obviously sometimes you can't get the real data, but you could have synthetic data based on that vertical and tell your story. So maybe one of the opportunities is, is sales professionals have, to, are they in the media and entertainment business? I just want to throw that out there because there, there are some researchers that are saying attention deficit, you know, we all know now 20 to 30% of sales professionals have it. 
We know that all of our client buyers, the human uh, cognitive condition in attention is down to what is it, seven seconds now, Malay, something like that. So you got to get them and you got to hook them in. Uh, but it's not the lunch that Greg thought. So any thoughts on uh, as you're going through your recruiting on the storytelling and the entertaining side? And what are your thoughts on that? Um, you know, we're seeing people send videos, right, all over the place now, uh, out, right, little clips, trying to catch your attention in new ways. You know, whether people listen to the videos, I, I haven't been following that research, but thoughts on uh, how, to, how to catch them. The, the thing I would say is that um, I saw a post on LinkedIn not very long ago, and I wrote a, <laughs> as I said, since LinkedIn doesn't have a don't like button, <laughs> <laughs> I had to write a, a little blog to kind of address it, but someone said that the starting point in selling is relationship. And I said, no. The starting point in selling is relevance. Are, are the things you, you're talking about or the product that you're showing or whatever, is it relevant to that person um, that company, their situation, their environment. And if you're relevant, that's going back to you, Cindy, that's where you get people who listen, who care, who get pulled in. Relationship is the end point. And to echo uh, um, what uh, we've heard before is that it's that consultative relationship is that people are gonna help you solve all problems, but you start with relevance. And it starts way up front in prospecting. We talk about prospecting in my book. Um, and it's relevance. Are you talking about a problem, a situation that I immediately in 10 seconds go, yeah, that would apply to me. Um, and that's really critical um, to getting people, uh, customers involved and want to listen. Thanks, Greg. Uh, Shannon, thoughts on, on relevance? We've got Fearless Curiosity and Relevance. That's two new books. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm going to add Passion, which I think comes out of um, sort of both of those two things. So, so, you know, I think where you're starting, Cindy, is, you know, there's a lot of different, um, I guess, means by which we can try to get attention. I'll be honest with you. I'm not a huge fan of some of the ones that are a little bit more hokey in terms of video. I, I saw a post on LinkedIn just to share Greg a story. Um, it was sort of like somebody who was like going, ooh, like this, you know, there was a picture, I, I, forget, I think it was, um, oh, it was an actor I, whose name I'm not going to remember, but the message basically was, this is my response when we've connected on LinkedIn, and the first thing you're going to do is try to sell me something. Um, because, you know, people are, are in, and COVID has created a situation where we've, we lost some of the, you know, face-to-face -face networking opportunities and the ability, um, you know, to be face-to-face uh, -face with folks. But, um, you know, just because we have all these tools doesn't mean that we can just kind of project ourselves into this kind of artificial relationship. We, we need to have relevance, as Greg mentioned, but um, I think we need to be genuinely curious and kind of seeking to understand what issues or challenges uh, an individual or an organization has to even understand whether or not what we have is going to be um, of interest. So it's, it's, a, it's a starting point to build relationships, but I think people are becoming, uh, you know, I'm just seeing it too often. I, I get, you know, probably 15 requests a week from people who are trying to sell to me through through LinkedIn via my title, but they're missing that opportunity to really understand what, what do I do? How is my business unit within BlackBerry different than others? Um, and, they, and they're just, um, I don't know, it's, it's the new um, uh, email blast, I guess, approach to, you know, trying to get a message out there in, in this like shotgun type of an approach rather than trying to be more tailored and more specific and um, be genuinely, you know, curious and passionate. And, and um, you know, I think what used to be really nice about LinkedIn was that you could get to know specific interests and areas um, of experience that individuals had to try to create that personal connection, right? What can I learn about what Cindy 
Gordon is 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 um, interested in, and what does she write about, and and how does that maybe align to something that you know I share in common with her, so that we can look to build that kind of synergy before we start down any path of you know trying to understand if I have something to sell that she might be interested in. Thanks, Shannon. Um, so just in summary, uh, you know, so far we've talked about a great deal and what the changing landscape, the need for incremental focus and discovery relevance, and also the fearless curiosity of engagement in asking questions that really are very thoughtful. So that begs the question on call planning. Um, in order to really, you know, before you put the wheels in motion, which salespeople are really good at, uh, thoughts there and how you're, you know, changing some of your change, your, I would call it your sales process methodologies. I remember, you know, Greg, when we were at Xerox, you know, we would have these account reviews for call discoveries, all the questions you're going to ask, all the stakeholders before you would actually get there. Um, and yet when I go into a lot of enterprise accounts, the pressure and the time to do that is um, it's not as 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 um, focused as maybe it could be. So I'd love your thoughts on call planning and discovery because it does take uh, some time. Yeah, call planning is one of the things that uh, I've, I've talked about four areas that are critical to B two B selling success. One of them is certainly call planning, um, and. Uh, my experience is that a call plan uh, follows the same steps in the, the same order on every call. Um, the difference is what are you trying to achieve in that call? It could be a discovery call. It could be a, um, a, a presentation call. It could be, but, but the, the kinds of things that you're going to do um, are identical the, the the steps and the stages um but a lot of times without call planning we get in there <laughs> to use the old phrase we let the fur fly and uh um quickly get into talking about product and pricing and uh and then before we know we're out of time and we didn't learn anything about the customer's environment and what they really care about and who else is involved in the decision process and we walk out the door feeling really good and we got nothing and so the next time I send an email and somebody starts ghosting me or phone calls up and they ghost me, it's like, I don't know why. And I got nothing. I, I've got no, no hook to go back into. So I'm a, a big advocate of good call planning. It doesn't need to be uh, onerous. If it's a simple call, you can do it in five minutes on the back of a napkin. If it's a complex call, it probably should take a half an hour or so and have a few people involved. Uh, but to go in and just wing it is just um, risky. Thanks, Greg. Shannon, how are you approaching uh, your complex cycles? Anything you can share in terms of operating process or lessons learned? Yeah, I, I sort of, it, I almost feel, and, and Greg, you might have a thought on this, is um, it, it's almost like for every one hour you're, you're, you're going to spend with a prospect, you need two to three hours of kind of prep time behind the scenes in order to make the most out of that time. Um, I, you know, we, you know, with my team that I have right now, we, by the time we've nailed all the schedules down for three or four key decision makers, like our ability to reschedule or get more time with them, it's, 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 it's really hard um, and it can delay things even more. Um, so I've been really trying to push and sometimes the patience of the team can be a challenge, right? Because we're having a lot of internal meetings just in, in investing in the preparation to have a really good call and to get as much accomplished in that call as possible. So um, I try to push, you know, rehearse, 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 um, and to really understand who's gonna be at the, the meeting because we've also had surprises where lo and behold, we, you know, we, we thought we had one or two key decision makers and then that invite mysteriously has made its way to a couple of other decision makers. The next thing you know, you've got four people uh, or more on a call and that can really um, derail things. So just really kind of understanding what do we need to accomplish um, who, what roles, because, you know, we also do a bit of a team cell approach where I will join with, you know, um, senior account executives on my team, sometimes even our general manager. 
for joins. Um, so instead of, you know, also making sure we're not stepping on top of each other, what's the role we're each playing? What are we there to do to support? Um, what key questions or um, objectives within the meeting are we trying to drive forward? So role alignment, um, re a lot of rehearsing to make sure that we've got down pat what we want to get out of the call. Um, and to really just be mindful that, that we may only have this opportunity or another one to, to kind of really align with our key stakeholders. So to treat that time as, as very valuable. Yep. Go ahead, Greg. I was just going to say 100% agree. That's what you said is that uh, <laughs> there's, there's actually, um, I look at this kind of two parts of call management. There's a uh, the call itself, which is, you know, at a high level, it's what are our objectives? What are we going to ask? What are we going to tell? What are we going to uh, kind of close on? What do we want to get as the next step? So at a high level, those are the four things. But there's um, in an important opportunity, there's the opportunity, overall op opportunity strategizing. So I describe a process in a book, which is, um, you know, to do an opp uh, opportunity or deal review. Um, that starts with where's the customer in the buying process and i make a big distinction and um i've been called out on it is that it doesn't matter where you are in the selling process it matters where the customer is in the buying process just because you've given a proposal doesn't mean the customer is ready to buy just because you made a cold call and got a meeting doesn't mean that that's where the customer is in the buying process. So what you want is a roadmap that says, if the customer is in this stage of, a, of the buying process, what are the best things to do? And what are the things we should not do? Um, and so going back to your point, Shannon, is we can't do everything. Um, so we wanna pick the most critical things that will move the deal forward and position us better uh, to win that deal. And, and, that's, and that strategizing is what goes into your call plan. Mm -hmm. so the one other thing I would add, and Greg, I, I, don't, I might have overlooked this as I was going through some of your notes and experience, but I've also been really kind of advocating for post-call debriefs as well, especially mm -hmm. you know, when you've got that team cell approach, because it's, a, it's amazing to me how differently I might hear information than somebody else. Something Like everybody's experience, right? Gives, you know, you, you hear with a lens based on, you know, either your industry or, or perhaps the, the level or the connection you have with different folks on the call. So um, as quickly as right after, so I, I've tried to get into the habit of, okay, if we've got a call block from one to two, then, you know, at 2.15, we're jumping on a call to debrief because we want to capture, you know, all of that fresh information that we just heard and then really be clear in alignment um, on next steps. And it's amazing how sometimes we've had internal almost arguments over the fact that, well, I heard this, no, I heard this. And I'm like, we're all on the same call, uh, but best we get that kind of understood and figure out, okay, did we need to ask another clarifying question? Cause maybe we all misunderstood it or, um, you know, obviously in each person playing a role, they might've been so focused, they just didn't hear the information the same, at the same level as somebody else. So.